Hello, I'm Alma Angeles, and you're watching Eagle News International. And I'm CJ Hero. Welcome to the program. Now on tonight's headlines. According Authority to, uh, said Hong Kong may have entered a new wave of the COVID-19 epidemic and the government will continue to tighten the anti-epidemic measures in response. U.S. President-elect Joe Biden accuses Donald Trump of brazenly damaging democracy as the incumbent's campaign to reverse his election loss through fraud claims was dealt another blow with a recount in Georgia. The World Health Organization no said one person dies of COVID-19 every 17 seconds in Europe. And a shop in Japan has enlisted a robot to ensure customers are wearing masks as the country prepares for a possible third wave of coronavirus infections. First, in Hong Kong, infectious disease experts warn that Hong Kong's fourth wave has already started. Secretary of Food, Health, Food and Health, Professor Sophia Chan, said Hong Kong may have entered into a new wave of the pandemic and the government will continue to tighten the anti-epidemic measures in response. Take a look. According to uh, the experts and also uh, the information from the uh, Center for Health Protection, uh, we have probably uh, entered you know, into uh, a new wave of, um, of cases. But of course, we are now uh, doing our best and also before we even started uh, uh, this uh, situation, this severe situation, as you may note, uh, in the past week, we have already uh, tightened many of our measures, including uh, border control measures, uh, quarantine uh, measures, uh, hotel regulation measures, uh, and also uh, some of the uh, social distancing measures. We will continue to uh, tighten uh, the uh, measures. And if you remember, uh, way back in September, we have already uh, listed six uh, major measures in preparation for the fourth wave coming, so that our capacities and also uh, many of our current measures uh, 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 can, be, can be executed as soon as possible in response uh, to this wave. Of course, the hotel station, uh, as I have said earlier, we met with the hotel industry last night and ironed out all the uh, details that uh, we would like the hotel industry to follow. Uh, many of those uh, instructions and measures, uh, some of the hotels are already uh, following or executing. But then, now that we have the law, we want to be uh, very clear uh, that we will be issuing uh, the directions to the uh, hotel uh, as soon as possible. I would uh, appeal uh, to uh, people uh, to stop all the uh, unnecessary uh, gathering activities because uh, uh, the situation uh, is uh, severe now in Hong Kong. Now, officials said non-essential indoor gatherings should be postponed with immediate effect and the public should be prepared to face school closures and to work from home again if caseloads doubled or tripled in the next few days in view of the latest development of the epidemic. The Civil Service Bureau also today reminded bureaus and departments to handle work arrangements for employees with flexibility provided that the provision of public services would be maintained. The turn for the worst comes two days before the former British colony is also due to launch an air travel bubble with fellow financial hub Singapore in what is the world's first quarantine free travel arrangement open to all residents. The bubble would be suspended for two weeks once the seven day moving average of local untraceable cases in either city rises above five. Claims of fraud and calls for recount escalated again today in battleground states from the presidential elections. President Trump's lawyers and allies have turned the post-election spotlight to the people who canvass and certify votes. President-elect Joe Biden said the efforts were debilitating to the country. Watch this. 
Let me choose my words here. Uh, I think they're witnessing incredible irresponsibility, incredibly damaging messages being sent to the rest of the world about how democracy functions. In Wisconsin, officials formally ordered a recount. In heavily Democratic Milwaukee and Dane counties, paid for with $3 million from the Trump campaign, the rancor on how to conduct the recount was in full view last night as state election officials argued for six hours. Mr. Biden won the state-by-state -state electoral college votes that ultimately decide who takes the White House by 306 to 232, flipping five states that went to Trump four years ago. That includes Georgia, where a hand recount of its five million ballots showed Thursday that Biden is the first Democratic presidential candidate to win the southern state in almost three decades. Earlier Thursday, Trump had dispatched his lawyer Rudy Giuliani to give a news conference where he read affidavits claiming fraudulent voter activity in multiple states and said the campaign would file a new lawsuit in Georgia. Would suggest that there was a, a plan from a centralized place to execute these various acts of voter fraud specifically focused on big cities and specifically focused on, as you would imagine, big cities controlled by Democrats. Well, the recount being done in Georgia will tell us nothing because these fraudulent ballots will just be counted again because they wouldn't supply the signatures to match the ballots. So it means nothing. Pennsylvania. The margin of victory now for Biden, which is a, not a victory, it's a fraud, is 69,140 votes. We cannot not allow these crooks, because that's what they are, to steal an election from the American people. They elected Donald Trump. They didn't elect Joe Biden. Joe Biden is in the lead because of the fraudulent ballots Meanwhile, staying in the United States, the country registered more than 2,200 deaths from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, according to the Johns Hopkins University tally on Thursday, a record high since May as the pandemic surges across the country. The number of cases at 8.30 p.m. was 11,000 or 11,717,947 with 252,555 deaths, meaning 200,146 new infections and 2,239 more deaths in 24 hours. Now, U.S. authorities have urged Americans not to travel for the Thanksgiving holiday next week as virus cases soar. California also on Thursday announced a nighttime curfew aimed at curbing the pandemic. In the last seven days, we've seen over a million cases reported of COVID-19. We've also seen dramatic increases in hospitalizations and also increasing deaths. So knowing that people are looking forward to the Thanksgiving holiday and getting together to celebrate, we felt that it was imperative to make a stronger push to recommend not traveling for the holidays. The safest way to celebrate Thanksgiving this year is at home with the people who live in your household. Um, people have college students coming home for the, for the holidays or family that are living other places in the country. And so oftentimes you can think of your household being your family members. But if those people haven't been living with you in the 14 days before you're together, they shouldn't be considered a member of your household. Americans were on Friday facing a growing raft of coronavirus restrictions, even as pharma giant Pfizer and partner BioNTech prepare to file an emergency request to roll out their vaccine. California announced a nighttime curfew and authorities urged people everywhere to not or not to travel for Thanksgiving as the country was hit by a spike of more than 2,200 deaths, the worst daily toll since May. 
New York City on Thursday closed its schools, affecting 1.1 million students, but left gyms and bars open. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, said that Pfizer is expected to file tomorrow for emergency approval of its new COVID vaccine. Watch this. Pfizer's partner, BioNTech, has announced that tomorrow they intend to file for emergency use authorization at the FDA. We need to actually double down on the public health measures as we're waiting for that help to come, which will be soon. We'll be getting vaccine doses into people at high priority at the end of December. We're not talking about shutting down the country. We're not talking about locking down. We're talking about intensifying the simple public health measures that we all talk about. Meanwhile, the U.S. top infectious disease official said the two coronavirus vaccines being tested were solid and that the speed at which they were developed has not compromised its safety or integrity. Dr. Anthony Fauci spoke at a rare briefing from the White House Virus Task Force to reassure some public concerns about the two vaccines, one from Pfizer, BioNTech, and the other by Moderna, after both companies announced successful trials. Let's listen in. And then two Mondays ago, about some reticence of people, well, did you rush this? Was this too fast? Is it really safe? And is it really efficacious? The process of the speed did not compromise at all safety, nor did it compromise scientific integrity. It was a reflection of the extraordinary scientific advances in these types of vaccines, which allowed us to do things in months that actually took years before. So I really want to settle that concern that people have about that. What about the decision of the data? Who looked at the data? Was that some force that was maybe trying to put something over on you? No, it was actually an independent body of people who have no allegiance to anyone, not to the administration, not to me, not to the companies, that looked at the data and deemed it to be sound. Now that data will be examined very carefully by the FDA, who together with a advisory committee, the Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, or VERPAC, are going to look at that before the FDA makes the decision about putting this forth for an emergency use authorization or ultimately for a license. So we need to put to rest any concept that this was rushed in an inappropriate way. This is really solid. Now, what does that mean for us? We now, as the Vice President said, are telling you that help is on the way, which has two aspects to it. It means that we need to actually double down on the public health measures as we're waiting for that help to come, which will be soon. We'll be getting vaccine doses into people at high priority at the end of December. We're not talking about shutting down the country. We're not talking about locking down. We're talking about intensifying the simple public health measures that we all talk about. Mask wearing, staping distance, avoiding congregate settings, doing things to the extent that we can outdoors versus indoors. If we do that, we'll be able to hold things off until the vaccine comes. People protest in New York against the shutdown of public schools, which was announced to fend off a second coronavirus wave. While European countries have so far kept schools open, focusing instead on shutting down indoor dining, bars and gyms, America's most populous city has taken the opposite approach. Mayor Bill de Blasio said Wednesday the United States' biggest public school system, which teaches 1.1 million students, would revert to remote learning on Thursday out an abundance of caution. Almost 13,000 New Yorkers have signed a petition entitled Keep NYC Schools Open that campaigners and kids delivered to City Hall and State Governor Andrew Cuomo on Thursday. In it, they argue that officials are sacrificing children's futures to keep non-essential businesses open. Thousand. 
Meanwhile, the World Health Organization said one person dies of COVID-19 every 17 seconds in Europe. WHO's Regional Director for Europe, Dr. Hans Kluge, said in a press briefing that Europe has now more than 15.7 million confirmed coronavirus infections with over 4 million new cases recorded in November alone. Take a look. There have now been over 15.7 million COVID-19 cases and nearly 355,000 deaths reported to WHO, with over 4 million more cases in November alone in the WHO European region. Europe accounts for 28% of global cases and 26% of deaths cumulatively. In the region, over 80% of countries are reporting elevated 14-day incidents greater than 100 per 100,000 population, with nearly a third reporting very high 14 days incident rates, more than 700 per 100,000 population. As a result, we are seeing increasing signals related to overwhelmed health systems. In the past two weeks, COVID-19 deaths have increased by 18%. Last week, Europe registered over 29,000 new COVID-19 deaths. That is one person dying every 17 seconds in the European region from COVID-19. The European Union could approve two coronavirus vaccines being tested by Pfizer, BioNTech and by Moderna before the end of next month, EU Commission President Ursula von der, von der Leyen said on Thursday. She said the European Medicines Agency could give conditional marketing authorization as early as the second half of December if all proceeds without any problem. With Thank you, madam. And if all proceeds with no problems, Emma tells us that the conditional marketing authorization for BioNTech and Moderna could happen as early as the second half of December 2020. The gold standard is always the PCR, but the PCRs are way more expensive and they need laboratory capacity so it lasts longer till the result is there and therefore the rapid antigen tests are very interesting for example to manage outbreaks or to regularly monitor high-risk groups so it is important to have a rapid antigen tests that have a sensitivity that is above 80 percent And staying in Europe, let's get the latest coronavirus situation in Geneva, Switzerland. Joining us live is Christine Benedicto. Hello, Christine. Hello, Alma. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Thank you for asking. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so how is it? How is it in uh, Geneva? Tell us, please. Okay, so as Europe faces the second wave of the pandemic, Switzerland is right in the center with one of the highest number of cases in proportion to its residents. The ratio in the past two weeks is right below 850 per 100,000 residents. In the past 24 hours, close to 5,000 cases have been added to form a total of more than 290 cases nationwide since February. Fortunately, daily infections have been decreasing. If we look at the ratio in the past 28 days, it was at more than 2,100 per 100,000 residents. Compared to the 850 ratio in the past 14 days, the difference, uh, the decline is impressive. Sadly, another 111 lives were claimed in the past 24 hours for a total of 3,000 575 fatalities. So the small canton of Geneva, with its international exposure and dense population, is unfortunately one of the sad leaders in terms of case ratio. More than 1,500 cases per 100,000 residents in the past 14 days. Thankfully, encouraging signs of lower daily cases can be seen after the canton imposed a partial lockdown 
three weeks ago. Non-essential shops and businesses, as well as cultural and entertainment facilities, will remain closed at least until November 29th. Public and private gatherings are restricted to five people, but schools remain open for students from primary to high school levels. Some restaurants and shops also rely on delivery and pickup systems to continue their activity at a certain level. Um, some business and restaurant owners have actually openly expressed their discontent with the semi-lockdown measures. We can take a look at that uh, in more detail later on if we have, more, if we have time. Um, but on a more positive note, due to a decline in daily cases, some of the lockdown measures will actually be lifted starting this weekend. For example, we can go to hairdressing salons or beauty institutes, uh, have sessions with a sports coach. All these will be possible, but under very strict health guidelines. If we look at the numbers from yesterday, 533 patients are confined and 75 of those are in intermediate and intensive care at Geneva's University Hospital. The situation remains critical and is taking a toll on frontliners and people working in the background. Hospitals are pushed to their limit and funeral services are now working at their maximum capacity. Uh, Geneva has actually sought reinforcement from the army fire brigade and volunteers. Currently, more than 300 of them are helping in various tasks from disinfecting ambulances to transporting patients and even more. Um, the pace of life is indeed slower nowadays as many people work from home. Public transport is uh, working only at 92%. Streets are emptier and the once bustling Geneva International Airport, although it's tiny, is now very quiet. Uh, that's our update from Geneva, Switzerland. Back to you in the studio. All right. So you mentioned some discontent uh, with the lockdown measures. Can you uh, give us more details on that? Yes, it's true. A uh, protest at the heart of Geneva with hundreds of participants uh, took place Wednesday, so a few days ago. And these were people who joined the call, joined in the call of the Association of Restaurant, Cafe and Hotel Owners to say no more to the current lockdown measures, uh, demanding the immediate reopening of businesses. Some of their banners included uh, Closing the business every three months is not a solution. And some of them also had your laws, uh, rules equals our laws, L-O-S-S. -S. So they say that they've complied um, with all the prevention measures. They feel that they're being let down and not being supported enough by the government. Uh, but obviously there are uh, you know, measures in place, aid in place uh, by the government given to, the, to businesses, but um, they say that it's not enough. So for now, uh, restaurants will have to wait to reopen, uh, but uh, starting, starting this weekend, so starting tomorrow, beauty salons, uh, hairdresser salons uh, will be able to reopen. All right, that's great. Thank you very much for your update there in uh, Geneva. Looking forward to more updates coming, on, coming out of your uh, country. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Alma. I'm Christine Benedicto from Geneva, Switzerland. We live in interesting times. On to more news about lockdown. South Australia's six-day circuit breaker lockdown will be cut short, officials said Friday, blaming a pizza parlor worker who misled contact tracers about how he contracted the virus. Premier Stephen Marshall indicated a tough lockdown for the state's almost two million people would end late on Saturday, at least two days earlier than planned. Watch this. In what those investigations showed is that one of the close contacts linked to the Woodville Pizza Bar deliberately misled our contact tracing team. Their story didn't add up. We pursued them. We now know that they lied. I stress this point that this is still a very dangerous cluster and our expert health, uh, our health experts remain extremely concerned. We are still trying to locate thousands of people who may have had dangerous contact at the Woodville Pizza Bar. Even more, now that we know that this person lied, we need to find and isolate a whole new group of associates. We are still urging South Australians to get tested. But just as we have acted immediately to put restrictions in place to keep South Australians safe, 
we are going to act to lift them much sooner than previously advised. I will not let the disgraceful conduct, conduct of a single individual to keep South Australia in these circuit break conditions one day longer than what is necessary. However, this lie still means that our contact tracers need breathing space to contact people, but not for as long. Effective immediately, exercise in family groups is now permitted. Effective as of midnight on Saturday, the stay at home order uh, will be repealed. Uh, they will be replaced by new orders, which the police commissioner will go through in a few moments' time, but will include a density arrangement of one per four square metres, 50 people at funerals, 10 people at private home gatherings, and schools will become open again. Red-faced authorities stressed the costly lockdown had still been necessary and that customers who had visited the pizza parlor should still come forward for testing. On Wednesday, they ordered schools, shops, pubs, factories and even takeaway restaurants to close and stay-at-home orders were issued for residents across the state. Since then, tens of thousands of tests have shown no new community transmission and that the cluster totals only 25 cases, leading to accusations that authorities overreacted. Meanwhile, health authorities said South Korea is facing a third wave of coronavirus infections in the greater Seoul area. South Korea recorded 363 new infections on Friday. That marks the third straight day cases have exceeded 300. The daily figure is the highest since late August. Health authorities raised distancing regulations one level on South Korea's five-tier system this week from level one to level 1.5. Going to the next step, Level 2 would prohibit any gatherings of more than 100 people and force high-risk venues such as bars, nightclubs, karaoke rooms and concert halls to suspend operations. In a televised address on Friday, Prime Minister Chung Sie Kyun called the latest wave of infections a crisis. And he also urged South Koreans, especially those above 60 years, to minimize unnecessary outings and meetings as winter approaches. BioNTech co-founder Yugur Sahin on Thursday said the front-runner COVID-19 vaccine his German firm is developing with Pfizer could be rolled out before the year is over in the United States or in Europe. In a Zoom interview, he said they are working at full speed, confirming that the companies plan to apply for emergency use authorization of their jab in the U.S. on Friday, while European regulators will receive another batch of data next week. He said there is a chance that we can receive approval from the U.S. or Europe or both regions this year still. He said we may even start delivering the vaccine in December if everyone works together very closely. Now, Belgium has detected an outbreak of bird flu, leading authorities to order all poultry farmers and individual bird owners to keep the animals confined, the country's food safety agency, AFSCA, said on Saturday. Avian influenza has recently spread to Western Europe after outbreaks in Russia and Kazakhstan this summer. <laughs> Bruges is known because of his swans. Uh, they are swimming on our uh, rivers and canals in Bruges. We have uh, more than 120 uh, swans, but because of the bird disease, uh, the sickness of birds, we have to catch them from our canals and to keep them safe in uh, this uh, place here. So uh, all the swans uh, has to be taken. It's not so easy to take them. Yeah. 
uh, you have to do it uh, even when you have at home chickens uh, and so on, you have to do it. So this is the obligation from the federal government that we have to take the swans uh, out of the free uh, spaces in our city and keep them safe uh, in a place where they can hide from uh, birds uh, coming from everywhere and uh, uh, birds who are sick. <coughs> And we'll take a short break. Eagle News, we'll be right back. ...is brought to you by RJK Services Manpower Agency Corporation. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. The global economy faces a hard road back from the COVID-19 downturn and nations should remove trade barriers on medical technologies to aid the recovery that is according to the IMF today. The call from Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva, head of this week's uh, G20 Leader Summit, comes as countries grapple with the fallout from a pandemic that has killed hundreds of thousands and caused a sharp contraction in growth. Major pharmaceutical companies are now closing in on vaccines against the virus amid a global spike in cases that has caused some countries to reimpose restrictions to curb transmission. Ms. Georgieva said the resurgence in infections is a powerful reminder that a sustainable economic recovery cannot be achieved anywhere unless we defeat, she said, the pandemic everywhere. Meanwhile, Indonesia's central bank slashed interest rates again Thursday after the COVID-19 pandemic pushed Southeast Asia's biggest economy into its first recession in more than 20 years. Bank Indonesia cut the key lending rate by 25 basis points to 3.75 percent, its fifth rate reduction this year as the global health crisis slams the brakes on growth. The move comes two weeks after Indonesia posted its second consecutive quarter of negative growth, the country's first recession since 1998-1999 Asian financial crisis. Central Bank Governor Peri Wargio said this is a follow-up step to accelerate the national economy's recovery. The government has unveiled more than $48 billion in stimulus to help offset the impact of the virus, which forced large-scale restrictions that hammered growth. Several million Indonesians have been laid off or furloughed as the vast country, home to nearly 270 million people, has battled to contain the crisis. Meanwhile, China's aviation regulator will not yet allow Boeing's troubled 737 MAX jet to fly in the company's biggest market, Owing to lingering safety concerns, despite the U.S. lifting a ban on commercial flights, Boeing's best-selling aircraft was grounded worldwide early last year following two crashes that killed 346 passengers. It has since faced lengthy tests and approval processes with aviation regulators worldwide. But the Civil Aviation Administration of China said on Friday that there was no set timetable for the resumption of flights according to state broadcaster CCTV, dealing a blow to the plane-making giant. China was the first to suspend flights of the aircraft. Okay. 
Bitcoin rallied for the third consecutive day, gaining $1,500 to approach an all-time high in a market that is now ready to take on risk. In late European trading, the virtual currency was worth $18,000. Forex.com analyst Fawad Razakzada said there has been strong appetite for all risk assets, including cryptos, in the wake of extraordinary government and central bank stimulus measures to combat the negative impact of the pandemic. The coronavirus has forced officials to support financial markets with cash and loan guarantees to ward off an economic collapse, attenuating the level of risk and helping stock markets in the United States to set new records on Monday. Bitcoin was created in 2008 by the pseudonymous or pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto and marketed as an alternative to traditional currencies. We still have more updates for you. Please don't go away. This portion is brought to you by Canary Corporation, your ventilation and air conditioning specialist. Services offered, supply and installation of elevators, escalators, air conditioners, ventilators, jet towel hand dryers, generators, access control system, factory automation, and modernization. For more info, please contact Ami Kanke at 0915-263-7198 or 0998-900-3224. In other news now, Ethiopia's army chief accused uh, the WHO boss, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, the country's highest profile Tigrayan abroad, of lobbying in favor of the dissident region and helping, helping them get weapons. He has worked in neighboring countries to condemn the war. He has worked for them to get weapons. That is according to Army Chief Beranu Jula in a press conference. He also said Dr. Tedros had left no stone unturned to help Tigray People's Liberation Front. The party Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed says he's targeting in a military offensive in the region. Mr. Abbey, last year's Nobel, Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, accuses the TPLF, which dominated power for three decades before his appointment in 2018, of seeking to destabilize his government. Now in its third week, the controversial military operation, which Abbey says is essential to restore law and order in the country, has left hundreds dead and sent thousands streaming over the border with Sudan. Hurricane Iota's death toll has risen to more than 40 across Central America as search teams find more bodies in landslides. The landslides were triggered by flooding that overwhelmed whole communities of Honduras and Nicaragua. Rescue efforts are continuing and the president of Honduras is pledging to help thousands left homeless. Iota made landfall in northwestern Nicaragua on Monday as a giant Category 5 hurricane, the year's biggest Atlantic storm, and left behind catastrophic damage, the government in Managua said. It said 250 municipal brigades had been dispatched to collect fallen trees and debris from the hurricane. The giant storm, which gradually eased as it moved inland, devastated much of the area spared by Hurricane Eta, a couple of weeks ago. Meanwhile, the Chinese government has committed 22 million pesos to support the Philippines' relief efforts following the destruction brought about by Typhoon Ulysses, which killed 73 and affected thousands since it made landfall last November 11. Early this month, it donated relief goods worth about 1 million or 7.3 million pesos to help those hit by Typhoon Raleigh. The said donation will be distributed to the affected families in the provinces of Albay and Catanduanes early next week, according to the embassy. Aside from injuries, Ulysses also swept away houses and brought damage to agriculture and infrastructure in various regions.
Freak eye storms following an abnormal weather phenomenon has left 150,000 people without power and water in far eastern Russian city of Vladivostok and prompted a state of emergency. The exceptional weather brought down cables and trees with the government of, of the Primorsky region declared a state of emergency. The regional administration's deputy head said the situation with the electricity supply remains very difficult. The destruction is widespread. It could take several days to restore power. Freezing rain began pummeling the city of some 600,000 people overnight Thursday after a cyclone carrying hot air met an anti-cyclone carrying cold air, Boris Kubai, a local weather service official, said. He said in some places the resulting ice was 12 millimeters thick, something not observed in the region in 30 years. Meanwhile, the European Union announced on Friday it's donating 1.05 million euros in humanitarian aid to deliver emergency relief assistance to the victims of Typhoon Ulysses. This is on top of its recent donation of 74.5 million pesos to support families affected by Super Typhoon Wally, raising its total contribution to Manila's Typhoon response to 1.34 or 134 million pesos as of November 20. The EU is scaling up its humanitarian assistance in the Philippines in response to the devastating typhoons that have hit the country over the past month, according to Arlene Aquino, who oversees the EU's humanitarian response in the Philippines. She also said the additional contribution will help to get much-needed aid to the most vulnerable people to help them go through this difficult time. The Earth Observation Satellite Sentinel-6 is scheduled to be launched soon. Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, the latest in a series of spacecraft designed to monitor our oceans, is scheduled to launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base in Central California on Saturday, November 21st of this year. The satellite will be followed by, in 2025, by its twin Sentinel-6B. Together, the pair is tasked with extending our nearly 30-year-long record of global sea surface height requirements or height measurements. Instruments aboard the satellites will also provide atmospheric data that will improve weather forecasts, climate models, and hurricane tracking. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that if climate change continues at today's rate, sea levels could rise by a meter by the end of the century. This could be dangerous for many countries. It would affect not only the Maldives in the Indian Ocean, which is the lowest lying country on Earth at an average of 1.5 meters above sea level, but even the coasts of Europe. And a badly damaged telescope in Puerto Rico is shutting down. The National Science Foundation says that the iconic Arecibo radio telescope is unstable and beyond repair. After years of hurricanes, humidity, and earthquakes, the telescope with its 1,000-foot-wide dish was built in the 1960s. It has searched for planets, asteroids, and possible life forms. All right, joining us live from Spain is Beverly Madrid. Hello, Beverly. Hello. Okay, Beverly, um, I can't hear you. Hello, Beverly, can you Hello, hear me? Hello, Alma. There you go, yes. okay. Hello, Alma. Go ahead. Good evening. Good evening, Beverly, go ahead. What do you have for us? Spain, yes. 
Spain approves late-stage trial of a virus vaccine. The launch of late-stage trials of Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine candidate has been authorized by Spain on Wednesday. According to the National Medicines Agency, AEMPS, the Phase 3 trial will be carried out in nine hospitals around Spain involving volunteers both with and without underlying health conditions. Aside from Spain, trials of the two-dose vaccine will also be tested in eight of other countries that involve up to 30,000 volunteers, such as Belgium, Colombia, France, Germany, South Africa, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Philippines. The agency has not specified how many people would take part in Spain, but they stated that uh, hospitals involved would begin recruiting volunteers as soon as possible. 20% of the volunteers will be under the age of 40, 30% will be over 60. They will be given either a dose of the experimental vaccine dubbed AD26.COV2.S or a placebo. The agency stated that the said trials are essential to guarantee the quality, safety, and effectiveness of vaccines. They also indicated that the results would be made available after all the data is analyzed at the end of the trials. Johnson & Johnson has already carried out mid-stage phase two trials of the vac vaccine in September in Spain and other countries. The medicines agency, a unit of the health ministry said that this will be the first phase three trial in Spain for the vaccine against COVID-19. As stated by the World Health Organization protocols, to be able to be approved for the industrial production, a candidate vaccine must complete three phases of clinical trials. Among these three phases, phase three trials are the largest. Once this last phase provides clear evidence of its safety and efficacy, a vaccine is considered ready to move into industrial production. Meanwhile, this week, candidate vaccines from two other firms, Pfizer and Moderna, had shown over 90% efficacy in their phase three trials. Back to you, Alma. All right, thank you very much for your update. Thank you for your time, you stay safe. And uh, we look forward to more updates there in Spain. Thank you, Beverly. Same to you, Alma. Same to you. Thank you. Reporting from Barcelona, Spain, I'm Beverly Madrid. We live in interesting times. Robo V the robot works at a sports shop in the Japanese city of Osaka, where he usually directs shoppers to what they're looking for. But during the pandemic, he has a new task, reminding customers who are not wearing a mask to put one on and asking people to keep their distance when queuing. Watch this. <laughs>
I'd be tempted to take my mask off just so he'd talk to me. <laughs> so Maybe cute. you can ask him to make us some coffee. <laughs> that would be nice. Well, that's it for tonight's broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I am CJ Hero. We'll see you again tomorrow. See you back tomorrow. And at the end of the day, there remains so much more to be grateful for. I'm Alma Angeles and we, we live, live in, in interesting, interesting times. times.